And I'm sure John Feinstein has spent some time in Annapolis. He also wrote the book, A Civil War, A Year Inside the Army-Navy Game. I appreciate your time, sir. This is a big game. I know it's a big game for you. It it uh, it warms your heart. Tell me what you love most Those. about this game. It, well, first of all, they did play in Mikey Stadium two years ago, Adam. Did they? Uh, oh, the, during the that's pandemic. Right, during the pandemic. Uh, and it was really a disaster because... Right. It was. It, it wasn't just cold. Obviously, cold yeah. in December, but it was incredibly foggy. Um, the TV announcers couldn't even see the field yeah. uh, for large <laughs> chunks of the game, and Army ended up winning fifteen nothing. Uh, and the Navy people will tell you they don't even count that game when they're adding <laughs> up the rivalry. That game didn't count. That's right. The only so people it, it, in the stands were uh, were the uh, were, the, were the cadets. cadets and right. There were, they there were no middies there, were there? No, no mids were there, and. Uh, uh, Trump came, right. um, still trying to convince people he'd won the election. <laughs> and at the end of the first quarter, you know, the tradition is that the president <laughs> changed the sides of the field at yeah. halftime. He goes from the Army side to the Navy side or vice versa. And Trump told the people he wanted to change sides at the end of the first quarter. Okay. Because he wanted, he wanted to change sides, wave, get his publicity, and then get out of it. Then leave. Okay. And they said, no, that's not the way we do it. We do it at halftime. So he just left. <laughs> um, much to everyone's relief, I suspect. But uh, th this is, uh, I always tell people this uh, Army Navy is my Christmas. Uh, I've been going since 1990. Um, it, it doesn't, you know, I have strong feelings for both sides, for the players and coaches on both sides. When my son Danny was younger, he would say to me, Dad, who do we root for right. in the Army Navy game? And I would say, whomever's losing. Uh, and that hasn't changed much. And I think. My feelings about Army Navy, because it's one of those events that unless you've actually been there, you can't understand how unique it is. Uh, from the march-ons to, you know, I'm not a big national anthem guy, mm -hmm. to be honest with you. Um, I don't think it's a very good song musically. <laughs> uh, but beyond that, uh, I think it would be more special if we only played it on occasions rather than at every single event. But when they play the national anthem, I'm starting to choke up. Mm -hmm. When they play the national anthem at Army Navy, and you see eight thousand hands, four thousand cadets, four thousand midshipmen, snap to salute position, choke up every time, and then the game is you know played with remarkable fervor. Uh, no matter what the team's records are, they both have losing records this year. Doesn't matter. Right. And then when they play the alma maters at the end of the game, and I'm always on the field for the alma maters, my wife always sends me a text. <laughs> and it says, are you crying yet? <laughs> and the answer is always yes. It's always yes. Because it's just, there's no moment quite like that in sports. I'm not knocking any other rivalries. You know, I don't believe you have to say, well, Duke Carolina is right. better or Ohio State, Michigan. I'm not knocking any of those rivalries. They're great rivalries. But Army-Navy is different yeah. because of what the young men are, <clears throat> excuse me, are going to go on and do when they graduate. And because there is a unique bond there among the players from Army and Navy. It doesn't come out during the game, but it comes out in the years after. John Feinstein is joining us here on the Adam Gold Show. We'll have the Army-Navy game, by the way, on the radio uh, here on 99.9 The Fan in Raleigh coming up. Um, yeah, When you said different, it because it doesn't – I'm not saying the outcome doesn't matter. It matters greatly <laughs> to the players and the yep. coaches and the two institutions and all of that. So I'm not going to dis, dis, like, di, diminish it in that regard. But the outcome is, I mean, Chris Patola, who was on with us earlier, really, he's, he's an Army guy, as you know. Uh, and I know very well. <laughs> yes, he just called it, he says it, it's a celebration. Yeah. Is is what it is more than anything else, and I wouldn't. I would almost not even put it in the rivalry category, because it rarely settles anything. Doesn't they're not in the same league? It's been you know seventy years almost since uh, these two teams were competing at the top of the sport. They used to, or at least I'm Army. Gonna put, did. I'm going to take you back sixty to Roger Staubach's team. Okay, in the in the early sixties. Yeah, yeah. So yeah. so it's been that long since somebody was uh, competing at the top of the sport. But it's right. – it. so his term, using it as a celebration, you've gotten close to the coaches uh, yes, in I this have. regard as well. What uh, 
What strikes you about, is, are there, is there a similarity among those men? Well, there is, uh, because if they don't know before they get there that coaching at an academy is different than coaching anywhere else, they figure it out pretty quickly. I think the best line I ever heard uh, on the academies was from Fred Goldsmith, who was an assistant at Air Force, and then, of course, as you remember, coached at Duke. Yep. And Fred said to me, the, the difference is, at a civilian school, the hardest part of a player's day is practice. And then academy, the easiest part of a player's day is practice. And I witnessed it up close when I, I did a Civil War. I was at somebody's practice every day. I was in the locker room uh, during the game. I think, Adam, that I am the only non-president of the United States who had access to both locker rooms before and during an Army-Navy game. I'm pretty proud of that. It was actually quite cool. Um, but you feel, you know, I've been around a lot of athletes i've been in a lot of locker rooms um the emotions that you feel before during and after that game are, are just not like anywhere else i mean i've been in the locker room at duke carolina games mm -hmm. and basketball um because they actually matter um <laughs> oh, man and and i felt the emotion but it's not like an army navy game especially in a year like this and in a year like 1995 when i did a civil war where neither team was going to a bowl and the seniors all know it's their last football mm -hmm. game. You know, maybe one, two might someday play in the pros. Army has a kid named Andre Carter, who people are saying is going to be a high draft pick. We'll see. Um, but for the most part, it's it's a, it's a, there's finality to it. That's what Ken Niamatololo said to me this week. There's such finality to it. And I was in the Army locker room after they won a, a classic game, 14-13, the year I did the book. And the players were all crying. Uh, and it wasn't so much tears of joy because they won. It was tears because they knew football was over. They knew it was over, that they had to go on their with their lives, that a, a major chapter in their lives had just closed. And when, you, when you're on that field after the game and you, you listen to the, the, the uh, playing of the alma maters, you see the players hugging one another, um, it's, it's, it's a remarkable sight. It really is. John Feinstein is joining us, the Army-Navy game coming up tomorrow. Here... This is something that fascinates me, that these guys are all obviously great athletes. Yes. I mean, they, they played high school football and were good enough to be recruited. When you accept the offer of a scholarship, of just admittance, which is to West Point or to Annapolis, you do so with the full understanding that Barring something really, really strange, Napoleon McCallum, um, right. you're you're playing but, for four okay. years, and then that's it. That's it. Yes. That's yes. that's it. So these guys know going in. Is there a, is there a common thread about that that struck you when you were doing the book? Well, that th th they understand it. That 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 when they take that uniform off. Uh, they're uh, ninety nine percent of them, or ninety nine point nine percent of yeah. them, are are done with organized football. And uh, like Kenny and Montalolo said, they the, the chapter is over. The football chapter in their lives is over. They may coach someday, um, you know. They, they they may have kids who play, but they're not going to play at that level. And you know, people there's a tendency to put oh Army Navy they don't compete for national titles anymore. Well, Navy's beaten Notre Dame four times in recent years. And there's no way Navy should ever beat Notre Dame. <laughs> Notre Dame's got every possible advantage mm -hmm. you can have as a football school. And and Navy's got every possible disadvantage because, like you say, coaches are sitting in the room and somebody says, well, what's the military commitment when we graduate? Five years. Five years mm -hmm. if you graduate. And uh, most players who have any chance to play in the NFL are going to run screaming from the room at that right. point. And yet, Navy has beaten Notre Dame. Navy has competed for the America Athletic Conference title. That's yeah. a good conference. Mm -hmm. Won't be as good next year, but it's a good conference. And Army has had some uh, tremendous wins. They beat Missouri in a bowl game uh, a couple years back. Uh, and that just shouldn't happen, Adam. <laughs> but the kids are so competitive, yeah. and they work so hard, and they outsmart their opponents a lot because they're always smaller than the yeah. opposition. Um 
and 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 they beat them with their their minds and their hearts and that sounds like a cliche or corny but it's true it just happens to be true yeah also the styles that both teams play lends itself right. to being a little bit weird based for the most part uh, over the last say 25 or so years maybe even right. longer uh, th- there there's been a lot of uh, a lot of triple option there but uh, look it is uh, it is very cool and it's a, it is an incredible scene I wanted to get one more thing in before I let John Feinstein go um, I think the last time I know you were down here recently for Duke and I'll, I'll ask you something about uh, mm-hmm. the first year of John Shire uh, in a second but I wanted to ask you one thing about golf. Because I want to go back to July at the Open Championship, and I believe you and I texted going into either going Sunday. into the final round or was yeah, on it was Sunday. Going into Sunday, right? And you and I both have. Uh, I I don't think I reach your levels of appreciation for Rory McIlroy. I man know crush. I, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes, uh, we certainly have to. We we might have to worry about the keep keep John out of the locker room uh, when Rory's in there. Um, do you think he just wanted it too badly, and that he yeah. couldn't kind of relax on Sunday? I think he did. Um, you know what shows up first when a player's nerves are bothering him? Putting. Yeah. Uh, he hit the ball great um, and had all the sorts of makeable putts and and made none of them yeah. coming down the stretch not one or two none uh lost by two strokes to cam smith who played a great final it was tremendous round, yeah 64 the last day of a major um but yeah i, I the, the the rory's problem right now quote unquote he's the number one player in the world so his problems aren't that bad no but he wants the next major because it's been eight years mm-hmm. so bad and He's not one of these guys who's going to say, well, I've won four majors. I'm going to the Hall of Fame. I'm rich. It's okay. That's not Rory. And the white whale, of course, is the Masters. And I have said that the way for him to win the Masters is to get about an eight-shot lead on Sunday <laughs> so that there's no pressure coming down the stretch. Um, and, you know, there are guys that's the way they do win their first majors, but he's won four, of course. Um yeah, and maybe maybe he he didn't get it done because I wanted it too much. I don't know. <laughs> it, it, nothing against Cam Smith, who played a great round yeah. of golf. Um, but I I really wanted Rory to win very much. Yeah. And by the way, can I get you? Get, have I told you the story about why my man crush is so strong? It, um, it goes back to an incident in North Carolina. Oh yeah, let's hear it. Um, I brought my wife and then three year old daughter to Pinehurst in 2014 for the Open. Yep. And we were in the little pub off the lobby at the Carolina Inn and Rory and his dad, Jerry, came in. And of course, it was packed. Yeah. And, you know, the manager's freaking out. Like, <laughs> here's Rory McIlroy. I haven't got a table. And Jerry McIlroy, being who he is, just said, don't worry about it. We'll go wait in the lobby when you have a table. Come and get us. Well, Rory came over to the table to say hello. And I introduced him to my wife, Christine, and to Jane, who, like I said, was three at the time. And Rory walked around the table and got down on one knee so he could be at Jane's eye level. And he said, so Jane, what did you do today? And Jane said, oh, we went swimming and we went into town and mommy, my mommy brought me a great new dress and I really had a wonderful time. And Rory said, geez, I, I wish I'd been with you because he'd shot one over par that day. I, said, <laughs> I wish I'd been with you. And, and Jane, of course, says, well, you can come with us tomorrow. And Rory said, you know, I just might do that. And when he walked away, I had for years said that I wanted my older daughter, Bridget, <laughs> to marry Rory so he could be my son-in-law. <laughs> so, And at that point, of course, Rory was married. And I said, so maybe 20 years from now, Rory gets his divorce and Jane's <laughs> a little older. And Chris said, the hell with that. I'll marry him. He's he's a great guy. And he's, 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 had really, a, he's a genuinely good guy. He's had, a, I think, a year that has put him back on the path to win majors. I think so, too. And for because I think he was energized by the, the split but between the PGA and be, Tour and, and Live Golf. And before that, by the Ryder Cup and how poorly he played. A hundred percent. You saw the emotion on yeah. uh, after he won his singles match on Sunday. Uh, right. But I I think the split between the two tours and the leadership he took uh, and the fact that he has not been shy about saying why the PGA Tour is where he feels like he belongs and he and right. he doesn't like it. And his public feud with Greg Norman, which I am here for uh, <laughs> because it's needed to be. I think a lot of these things have needed to be said. But I think if he wins one, 
he's going to win a lot more than just the one. I hope you're one. right. He's 33, which is the same age Phil Mickelson was when he won his first, and a year younger than Ben Hogan was when he won his first. And I think your point about LIV is, is very important. I, I just wrote a column in the Washington Post saying he should be the sports person of the year. No knock on Stephen Curry, who I love, <laughs> but because of all the things he did away from the golf course, yep. in addition to winning the two year long championships on the golf course, I said he should be sportsman of the year. And that may reflect a little bit of bias on my part, Maybe. but, but doesn't but, mean but you're I, wrong. I, I'm not the only one who feels that way. Yeah. Just, you might be biased, but it doesn't mean you're wrong. Uh, at right. Jay Feinstein books on Twitter. And if I, if I may, if you have a, oh, 10, 11, 12, 13 year old that struggles uh, finding something good to read, uh, pick up any one of John's books for kids, which are all awesome. I appreciate your time, sir. Uh, Adam, Merry, thank you. Merry Christmas. Happy Hanukkah to you and yours. And I'll talk Same to you soon. To you. And uh, yeah, if I don't talk to you, have great holidays. Thanks for having me. Take care. John Feinstein, the one and only.